Thank you for joining us today on Positively Charged Biz. We are here to motivate, inspire, and support our listeners as they write their life stories. We are a proud founding member of the Real Disrupt Podcast Collaborative, and you can check out more awesome podcasts at realdisrupt.com. Hey everyone, I hope you're having a positive and productive day. Today we have a very special person that has proven that we all have the ability to make a difference in the world. Allow me to introduce you all to Glenn Marsden, the founder and creative director of the highly publicized and perfectly perfect campaign. It has gained international recognition within a year, amassing a combined reach of over 4 million and gaining the backing of over 200 international public figures. He is now an executive performance coach working predominantly with modalities in business strategy and mindset with companies and he is a highly regarded speaker. Glenn, thank you so much for being here with us today. And on Positively Charged Biz, we like to start at the beginning. So please tell us, what was that pivotal moment that made you start the Imperfectly Perfect campaign? Well, first and foremost, thank you for having me. It's such an honor. Your work is incredible, so thank you for that. And in regards to your question, it was actually social media. So anybody that comes across the Imperfectly Perfect campaign, one of the whole premises is to literally disrupt social media and disrupt corporate silence. Because when I turned social media off for some time, back six years ago, I actually went through body dysmorphia with a background in the health and fitness sector and managed to get through that with cognitive behavioral therapy Moving forward to two years ago, when I turned social media back on, there was a notice that one of my friends from the UK had sadly taken his life. And that was the pivotal moment that sparked something in me. I had not seen this person, a friend, as I say, train with him at the gym every day, 14, 15 years ago now. So I didn't really know much about his life after that, because as you do, you lose contact after that amount of time. But there was something in me that kicked me in the stomach because I started looking more into it, saw a montage that his partner had put of him and her's life. And there was an interlude with him and his little boy. And with me having a little boy myself, I couldn't, even though I'd been in that space in my head of how do I get through this? I need to speak to somebody. I couldn't fathom how somebody could go into a space that they would think that their child would be better off without them. So it was something that really, it hit me. And it was this light bulb moment that like, I was, my God, I need to do something. And the more I started speaking out about it, the more people told me that they'd sadly lost friends and colleagues to it. And I reached out to several big organizations here in Australia, got thank yous, but no thank yous. Now I understand they probably get a lot of people reaching out to them. So with me being who I am and a determined guy, I was like, what can I do? And it just sparked this passion project. I still call it a passion project to me. And I use the tools of my trade. I do photography on the side and I'm able to capture visual images that can tell and convey a story. And I think because I've gone through adversity and I'm an empath, I could really pick up and, and capture some intricate details that showed the story behind someone's expressions. Wow, that's incredible because, and, and just as I said in your introduction, we all have experienced many different things, right? But it's very special when you actually take that action to do something about it. And then, like you said, you've reached out, you tried some different things, but it was really coming up with what would actually resonate with others. What would make it so people can click and kind of say, I relate to that. And I've seen your photographs, they're, they're incredible because I think everyone can relate to that, right? There's, um, you could almost, you know, it, it, we're going through this pandemic and we all have to wear masks, right? Yeah. But if you really think about it, isn't that what everybody does every day, regardless of a pandemic, right? People wear the mask in which makes it comfortable for others 
to do business with them, you know, have a relationship with them, whatever it is, it's that, what is that outer shell that mm -hmm. makes it so people are connecting to you, right? And so you've broken that down with your campaign and have made it where people have said, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm not okay. And being okay with not being okay. So please tell me, give me that initial reaction. Okay, so you come up with this, you've got the thought, um, you know, you know what you're going to do. Tell me what happens next. Yes. So it's pretty funny. Anybody that knows me knows how driven I am. And I was, I was just thinking initially, how do I make such an impact on a global level? Now, I always say it's an audacious goal, but I'm never one to not go for that goal. I'm just like, right, what can I do? I was like, I will start by sharing my story, but I know it will affect my immediate circle. But people who don't know me will initially read it they will feel for me, but then move on with their day. So I was like, right, especially because I've got two children of my own and I know you work in the mortgage industry. There's a lot of women entrepreneurs with ch children. One of my things with this is to create a legacy and a vision hmm. that our future generation, especially our children, just don't see mental health as anything different than a physical illness or, or, or a broken bone or something like that, that we can talk about it. So I was just thinking, right, how can I disrupt corporate silence? How can I disrupt social media? We see, and we often see, and it was one of my demises, I started the comparison syndrome with the body. And I looked at it a way of influential public figures, right? So we've got people in corporate infrastructure, we've got people in entertainment that are children, and even we at times look up to in the corporate sector and go, wow, they're such a prolific figure and they must have it all. And I just picked up the phone and I reached out through social media and nine out of 10 times, this is what stops people. They procrastinate and they think too much. Whereas I always go with a five second rule. I'm like, I don't do it within five seconds. I'm not going to do it. And I did. And like we, sp when we first conversed, I sent you a yep. voice note. And I think if you send a voice note, you can get the sincerity. You can hear why people are doing what they're doing and it draws people in. And they want to know more. So I did. And within the first three months, more public figures came forward. And within six months, it had reached the level of publications in Australia, New Zealand and networks. And by 12 months, the US had picked up on it. So it took me to LA where I featured on networks and then Southeast Asia. And in, in the Asian community, they actually don't speak that much about mental health. My wife being in the Asian culture from Thailand um, and then he just took off. And then the UK, obviously, with my accent being a little bit all over, I am originally from the UK, as everyone can hear. But um, yeah, it was just picking up that phone and just reaching out, telling people what I wanted to do and create a legacy for our future generations. And, and for ourselves, to be honest with you, because we are our own worst critics. And I've noticed disrupting corporate silence throughout LinkedIn. There is still a lot of highlight reels which, which is good. We want to show our accolades and we want to show our expertise. But at times what I've tried to do is create tribe mentality whereby we can break that down and show our vulnerability because now through the campaign, I've got to meet so many of these world's influential people, so successful, and they share their vulnerability. It's part of what makes their brand. It's part of what makes them them. So I don't know where this dis disconnections come into play that when people are on this ladder of climbing to where they want to get that they feel that they have to hide it because that is part of the stepping process. We all go through struggles and we're all, as I say, imperfectly perfect. Mm -hmm. So how do you recommend doing that? So give me an example, you know, to all the people listening and all the people out in the networks, how do we do that? Because to be quite honest, you know, especially LinkedIn, especially LinkedIn, mm -hmm. you're almost thinking, and, and listen, LinkedIn have co has come a long way. You know, oh, a well. few years ago, LinkedIn was, well, if you were looking for a job, you would go to LinkedIn and you would try to <laughs> yeah. network with people. But it's actually, like I said, it's come a long way and it's definitely morphing into so much more. So how would you recommend somebody from the corporate side show our vulnerability or show that obviously where, you know, it doesn't have to be a highlight reel. 
Yeah, I would actually, as, as I often do when I work in modalities and mindset and business strategy, why I tend to combine them is because when you are talking about personal branding or branding, people want to know the behind the scenes reels. So whether it's the mortgage industry, whether it's manufacturing, show the behind the scenes and what it took is what people connect to and resonate. When a lot of the times we're just seeing continuous highlight reels and, and self-proclaimed accolades, it's good but there is a disconnection that's brought in because people sometimes think it's unattainable for them, which in turn manifests into this comparison syndrome and they're thinking, I don't feel good enough. And the amount of times what I tend to say, and when I go into corporations, I bring this tribe mentality as I've just mentioned in, because I've worked with CEOs, I've worked with executives, I've worked with, the thing with me is coming from a health and fitness background, I used to teach group fitness to around 100 to 200 people. And the commonality in there was that people came in for connection. It wasn't about your profession. It wasn't about your role. Right. And I think from such a long way, I understand the role responsibility in a corporation, which is what I always delve into a lot of the time. But if someone dare open, and I always believe it should start from the top, show a little bit of vulnerability, not to say that you're going through it at the moment, but if you can say, look, I know where you are, I went through this, and this is what I was able to do, and really open and change that narrative, it can make people, A, feel more productive because they feel that you recognize what they're going through and you can help them. So it's working at both ends of the spectrum. The company is getting more productive uh, productivity from their team, and they're feeling like, oh, there is internal growth and I can open up and share this without being kind of demonized, criticized, whatever it's going to affect my career. And like you say, on LinkedIn, I always call it the Facebook of professionals now because people are opening up. Yes. You will notice it's like a, a, a breath of fresh air when somebody suddenly shows their vulnerable side and, and, and just opens up and changes, as I keep saying, the narrative and just going, you know what, like some of the most successful people have got to where they are and they haven't come without struggles. Yeah. So to answer your question, to open up, if you're leading from the top to your team, you can talk about your vulnerabilities, what it's actually taken you to get where you are and what you've had to go through and obstacles that keep coming up or have come up how you've dealt with them and how that's affected. As I say, I keep going back towards because you work with a lot of mothers in the mortgage industry and they're dealing with kids, they're dealing with business, they're dealing, and it gets very much like a high pressure cooker. It is. Like, you, you can't deal at times and that's okay. So if you've got a tribe mentality between your corporation or your entrepreneurs, like a mum group, that you can just go, oh, today I was just feeling the kids were annoying me. Like, I have this to do. And you can bounce off each other. I always say, take it back to an old school mentality where it was like, remove the monetary value and bring a barter system back in where you can right. kind of, like you can help me where I'm lacking or you can help me. My philosophy in life is each one teach one. And yes, money drives the world. But at the same time, there's nothing to say that if somebody's taught you something in your life and you've, you've utilized it, you can't just pass that little bit of wisdom to somebody else. And that's, that's the whole genesis of who I am and why I work the way I do. And just goes to show this message has gone international and off the back of it, I've been referred to so many companies to go in and talk about it. And the produ uh, productivity has gone up within corporations because people feel like, wow, it's, it, it is a, a, a breath of fresh air. We can yeah, actually- it's almost a weight off their shoulder, right? It's, it's almost a weight lifted. Okay, so now let's speak about, you know, and I can totally relate to everything that you're saying. And, and I, uh, especially when it comes to the women in my industry, because, you know, number one, there wasn't a lot of women leaders in the mortgage industry years ago. And thankfully, that's now changing, you know, so now you're seeing that. And yes, you know, I, I can, I can actually recall a post that I saw a few weeks ago where somebody took a snapshot of, it was a wet mortgage application. <laughs> and she said, tears happened while I was working today. And tons of women jumped on to say, it's okay, it happens, don't let it get to you. You know, private message me, I'm here for you. You know, let me, let me have a conversation, let's talk about it, we're gonna get through this. And I remember I was so proud of the women that were part of this group that we belong to 
because they did the right thing. They jumped in and they said, I'm here for you. It's okay. Listen, we've all been there. We've all had experienced that moment where we felt we just can't go on and we, it's okay. So I'm happy to say that that part of it, we're making progress, but let's speak about the generation behind. Let's speak about, we, we started the conversation with you speaking about social media and how you turn social media off for a while. This new generation, whether they're teenagers now, whether they're the age of your kids, you know, little ones, what do you think, how has social media affected how they're growing up? And what do you recommend when you do have teenagers or preteens in the home that are being introduced into that? Yeah, I would say it's, it, it's a big issue. Like it's monumental how our lives are impacted by social media. And as we know, they are predominantly a money-making machine. They draw attention to keep you on these platforms. Now, what I uh, tried to do was the intended purpose of a lot of these social communication tools was really to connect people wherever you were in the world. So by me saying disrupting corporate silence, disrupting social media, it's trying to bring back a positive nature towards them and bring back that commonality that yes, we all struggle, we all compare. So looking through the campaign, I don't want people to think it's a one, one shoe fits all. There, there are mothers in there talking about mental health through parenthood. There are women who've gone through endometriosis in turn affecting mental health, mm. clinical depression through men and everything. And then we've also got kids on there because we know like when you look at stats now, kids coming towards the age of four are actually having anxiety disorders, oh. the opioid addiction within teenagers these days, it's just getting out of hand. And there are a lot of attributing effectors to, to social media. So I like to always put a disclaimer out there. I've gone and got qualified in a lot of modalities to do with mental health. I'm no expert or professional, which is why there's always direct call to actions throughout the whole campaign. But what I would say and what I have learned is really limit the amount of time that your children are spending on these platforms or look into what they are looking at. I know my kids at the moment, well, my seven-year-old is obsessed with this TikTok and he's obsessed with- Really? Already? Get already. out, really? Because they're talking about it at school all the time and yeah. these dances. And then the other one, his, he watches these computer games, but he watches kids playing the computer games. Whereas I try and redirect him into the notion learn about coding and then you can get a job yeah. later on in life making the, these the other side right yeah, <laughs> redirecting and as we know you can always work with your kids to okay if you do this we'll we'll give you this or we'll like so it's kind of like a little barter system and playing around with them but yeah with my kids especially we really limit the time that they go i mean mine are really young but in terms of teenagers I once spoke to an influential public figure um, and his child, he was saying, came off the back of trying to sadly take his life. Um, and what they found out was that he got everything. So he was brought up into an affluent family. They've yeah. got the house, they've got this. And it turned out he was bored. Like oh. he looked at pictures or he looked at different countries and it was one click of a button and it was there. So we didn't feel like he had to go and experience it. He'd already experienced it through the thing. So as I say, just limit the time on there and, and take them to places. And I know it's really hard in business because you are working pretty much for your family and there's a lot of hours that go into it. But really, I always say disconnect from that time when you are working on a weekend and get them out in nature and experience things and everyone turns social media off and we can be our own worst enemy. So I'm efficient on weekends now. I plan all my posts and I put my phone away. My wife does. So it's like family time. Yeah. And especially, I mean, look at the pandemic, you know, since March, it, it's even worse. I mean, when you think about it, you know, people lost some of that personal connection and everybody moved to doing video calls and Zooms and, and, they, they got more attached to social media. I mean, all you heard was, oh, you've got a captive audience. Now, you know, everyone is on social media. So two things there. One, do you think that's accurate in terms of, do you think it's getting worse because people are so, and, and literally, I mean, for me, I'm thinking to myself, 
what's going to happen when it turns to winter in the United States, in the states where, you know, right now, sure, you know, we can, in the Northeast, we can go out right now. What happens when there's a foot of snow outside, you know, and people again are stuck inside their homes? So there's one. And then the second thing is, with the pandemic, I have to imagine people are feeling much more, um, you know, depressed or sad or just, you know, having more struggle. So what do you recommend, you know, and I know you're not a mental illness, I know that's not your specialty, but just in terms of, you know, human connection, you know, what, what have you seen or what have you heard about that? See, with both things there, there's, there, there's two sides to how I look on the spectrum. There's social media is becoming obviously a big attributing effect to mental health because more people are obviously spending more time and when winter comes up, it's going to be more um, prominent. However, on the other side, it is actually bringing what I see as COVID, the humanity back out. So we are yeah. seeing more vulnerability being shared and people although are spending more time on the platforms, if people are doing it user-friendly and creating spaces like we're trying to create and companies can triple, um, trickle and ripple this effect of kind of sharing this and creating groups so that company employees aren't affected as much. I see two sides of the coin with that one. I mean, with winter coming up, when it comes to our kids, as I say, I'd really monitor what they're going on and spend more family time together. Think of, I always say taking it back old school and get some board games out and really, really bringing it back to when we had no social media, just yeah. disconnect. On the other side of the spectrum, when I say with the COVID, I do think the humanity is, is being brought back out. So if we can really affect and open up this, this dialogue around it within companies, especially. So with the Imperfectly Perfect campaign at the moment, September, we're just commencing the international webinar series. So yes, a lot of tell us about this, that. Yeah, so a lot of people obviously utilizing Zoom. I wish I did have shares in Zoom. Uh, <laughs> we all, we all do. <laughs> <laughs> like three months ago, nobody really used it that much. And now, but um, on a lighter note, but yeah, seriously, we're, we're going in towards companies and we've really opened up this whole narrative in getting some of the faces behind the campaign that we often see. So the first set we've got Judy Thurison, who sadly lost her son to the opioid addiction. She's a grief counselor. He was a big Atlantic record um, artist and, and, and sadly they lost him. Mm. So she's going to be talking about grief and loss. Accompanying her is an expert in the mental health and wellbeing sector. So we've got a solution based webinar. We've got Jeremy Jackson, who people might have seen as Hobby Buchanan, David Hasselhoff, some yeah. of they were. He actually, at the height of fame, so as I say, it can attribute to corporate. You see CEOs and you see people like Jeremy, who was at the height of fame, he was getting million dollars checks, everything thrown. But when you hear his story, he grew up without a father. He had a circle of people around him that were making money off him. So when he did anything and, and, and got into addiction, they weren't stopping him because any bad publicity was good publicity. And he went to a place where he was hurting and that was on the streets because those people were hurting. And it ended he could up relate. He could, he could relate to them. Relate but mm -hmm. on the external, the press and the publicity was just Jeremy Jackson's gone off the rails. And now when I look at stories of Britney Spears and all these people, I'm just, I feel for them because I think when you're at that height of fame, unless you've walked in someone else's shoes, you just don't know. So I want to really close the gap on that as well. We often see people at the top of the games, like CEOs, multi-million dollar companies, and you think, oh, they must have everything. But what comes with that is probably million dollar problems as well. We don't see that part of it. So the webinar series is basically a solution-based webinar series whereby those faces are coming on. We're going to keep it going throughout corporations and they're featured with experts so that they're solution based and people know where to go and really just open the topic. I love that. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. Where do you see it going? What's your ultimate goal? Yeah. So my whole vision when I started this, as I say, I still call it my passion project. Yeah. And I'm just very grateful it's resonated. But I just see these webinar series taking off and filtering throughout all corporations around the world. Um, I've started the, the Tribe Mentality community where, 
you can send the hashtag in, I'm imperfectly perfect. And within, within two days, we got over 300 submissions of people around the world just, just placing it on the hand saying, I'm imperfectly perfect. That was and actually it, when I first saw it. That was uh, it. That was actually the very first post that I saw was the well, writing just, it on the hand. It, it causes this ripple effect. So I just see it in the end, just we're obviously... I wouldn't even say stationed in one, one city. Like it, it's going to be programming resources, but what I want to do a little bit different, there's a lot of advocates out there is work on the preliminary measures. Now there's a lot of people focused on what happens when it's happened. Now let's try and take it back a little bit. And I started talking to a lot of neuroscientists and mm -hmm. finding out what happens within the brain when neuron pathways are intercepted and, and going down that. So as I say, on the side of what I have learned through my campaign, I've also gone on this self-development journey of myself. Sure. And it's, it's, it's the person I am, which is why I could say now with my performance coaching, it just makes me better when I'm, I'm speaking or presenting to people because I just change that language around. And it's amazing when you connect people and you just bring yourself like on an equilibrium with, with other people. Because sometimes, as we know, within the corporate sector, if you look at a CEO, sometimes you hold them high and then there could be some people who look down on their employees and that's the gap I'm trying to bridge and just bring everyone. Because you're not going to move forward with productivity if, if, if there's such a disparity between a cleaner of the company or a CEO of the cleaner. You should treat everybody the same. Of course, of course. And, and that's actually one of my questions is that what, have, what are a few of the things that you learned through Imperfectly Perfect that now you say, wow, this should have been part of corporate business the whole entire time. What are some of those things? Yeah. So a lot of it is, I, I do think of what I'm trying to bring in with the performance coaching is a lot more self-development and team development internally. So whereby you're actually, you're talking about vulnerability. You're not putting people on the spot. So I don't believe that you should ask anyone to share the vulnerability in right. front of their employees. But there's ideas that I've created whereby you can do it in a safe environment, but also remove this. I do really need to look into America in terms of your application process. But in Australia, what I'm trying to do is abolish this question on a lot of applications for jobs whereby it does say, have you or do you suffer from any mental health issues? Now, that first of all could be anything from mild anxiety to clinical depression. It, there's such a wide spectrum of mental health issues. So for somebody on the external that may think, oh, if somebody has got something, I'm not hiring them. Yeah. Because in turn, that's going to affect productivity. It's going to... But then on the other end of it, I'm like, if someone's been to the depth of despair through clinical de depression and they have managed to climb themselves out and gone on to produce it, that takes a lot. Not only is that determination, that's motivation, that's drive, that's success in itself. So would you not feel that they were equipped to deliver because you know that they can? So yeah, it's, it's um, something yeah. I'm, I'm excited about. I, I will tell you, you know, as you're speaking about that, the word stigma came into my brain. That was what was hitting me as I was thinking to myself, you know, the thing about mental illness is that, you know, when someone breaks their arm, you can see there's a broken bone. Yeah. But when someone is experiencing any form of whatever it may be, how small or how large, you don't know. That's yeah. what's difficult. And, and that stigma of people feeling uncomfortable or embarrassed or, or ashamed, you know, to open up and say, I suffer from anxiety, I suffer from depression, I suffer from highs and lows or whatever it is, that shouldn't be the case. Because if they suffered from a pain in their arm, they would say, okay, this is what you do for the pain in the arm. But if you suffer from something like that, it's a stigma. And that's, well, go ahead. It it, what I tend to leave people with is, does it take somebody, a loved one, a friend, a colleague, a child, to sadly take their life for you to sit and suddenly question yourself and go, what if, should I have said, 
could I have done? I, I like to leave that with people because does it really take it to that point? Whereas these preliminary measures, we can get conversations started so people don't feel they have to suffer in silence. And I know straight away, there'll be some people listening to this podcast as with others and they'll sit there and they'll resonate and they'll be like, I agree with everything he's saying, but I still den, I still den. And I'm not saying just shout it from the rooftops, but speak to somebody in your immediate circle because you will be surprised. You don't want to tell your parents at times because you don't want to burden them with additional stress. You don't want to friends. But the first time that I shared mine and opened up, it was like, as you say, a lift yeah. off my shoulders. Yeah. And all it is, is as humans, we are conditioned. We want to try and fix things. So anybody listening that somebody comes to them and opens up, just listen. That's it. You don't have to fix it. You can just tell them that you're there for them. You can help them get help, but just don't try and go do this or try this right. or try this. Because what, what I will just say is with the campaign, so predominantly people go to the campaign, they'll see the images because images, how I, how I curated it, images, music, film, they connect. It's a communication tool. The oldest form of, of communication is storytelling. So you go, you see, you're affected. We watch a film, we're affected by emotion or, or comedy. And then through that, you read their story. That filters onto the podcast whereby I want to give a message of hope through each one. So when I went through mine, I first saw a psychologist and he was trying to pinpoint it to an early age. I never had an issue when I was early. I found out that my body dysmorphia actually came around the time of Instagram. So social media was not uh. like... I was comparing myself to these bodies, you see. Right. Um, so I didn't really, he frustrated me, that psychologist. So I wanted to show on the podcast is no shoe fits all. So listen to someone's story. If that's not for you and doesn't work, you can go to someone else's story and they might have tried something different. So whereby you can then go, just keep trying. Like, I think that's okay. very good advice. I yeah. think that's great advice. And I think the you, you don't have to fix them. I think that's also great advice because you are correct. Everybody's, oh, well, my brother, my sister, my friend, you know, did this. Right. I, we are not the experts, most of us. I'm sure there are experts out there, but yeah. <laughs> we are not the experts. So listening and guiding them to maybe go and speak to an expert or get, you know, someone that can help them. That would be great. Love it. Love it. All right, Glenn, tell us how everyone can follow, help support Imperfectly Perfect. You know, how, how can we continue to grow this and, and be behind this message? So please tell everybody how they can follow what, what's happening. Yeah, sure. So you can find us on all social media at Imperfectly Perfect Campaign. Our podcast is on Spotify called The Imperfectly Perfect uh, podcast. <laughs> um, and then the main official website is imperfectlyperfectcampaign.org and support help is just literally, I always say, if you're a company or an individual sharing the message, getting the conversation started. If you're wanting the webinar series to come within your company to really open up the dialogue, then you can contact us at info at imperfectlyperfectcampaign.org. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This was wonderful. I've never had someone from Australia before, so this was this was wonderful. We were able to connect. <laughs> thank you for everything you do. We wish you all the best, and I promise you I will be one of those people that will continue to be part of the conversation because I, I wholeheartedly believe in what you're doing, and I want to continue to support. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Positively Charge Biz. I'm Laura Brandeo, and we are here to motivate, inspire, and support our listeners as they write their life stories. If you have an inspiring story, please email me at laura at positivelycharge.biz. And remember to subscribe to hear more great guests. And connect to us on Facebook at Positively Charged and Instagram at Positively Charged Podcast. Until next time, we wish you a positive day.